Hey everyone, I'm Holly and welcome to Wine Unpacked. I'm back once again to help guide you through the world of wine from the comfort of your sofa. This month we're going to be talking about wine blends. We'll be exploring some common blends you might find and learning about why people blend wines in the first place. We'll also be checking out some common grape varieties that go into these blends, so the next time you see them on a wine list, you'll have a better idea of whether you like them or not. Because our wines today are reds, you'll want to serve them at room temperature, so no need to chill any of them. But if you want to take your caps off now, that will help some of the flavours to start developing. As always, you'll need a couple of glasses. And if you're looking for snack recommendations, things are going to get a little bit tanniny today. So olives, crisps, salty nuts, or maybe even some cheese will be your best bet to make the tannins more approachable. Once you've got everything you need in front of you, we're ready to get started. So let's get cracking and find out about blends. As you've probably worked out, wine blends are the result of blending or mixing one wine with another. This usually happens at some point between fermentation and bottling, and means you need different batches of wine with different characteristics in the first place. This might be wines from different grapes, but can also be from the same grape but with different vineyards, or even wines from the same grape and the same vineyard, but batches that have been treated differently during production, or a mix of all of these. Most wines you drink are actually blended at some point, even when there's only one type of grape being used, what we'd call a single varietal wine. The winemaker will often be blending a few different variations of wine from that grape to add complexity or to blend out any undesirable characteristics. What a desirable or undesirable characteristic is totally depends on what the winemaker is aiming for. It could be to make the best wine possible, sparing no expense along the way, a quality-led approach. Or it might be that they're looking to produce as much cheap and cheerful drinkable wine as they can, which is a more volume-led approach. Or they might be looking for a mix somewhere between the two. A really good wine, but not outstanding, and decent quantities that they can sell at a reasonable price point. Or finally, it could also be that they have a specific style for their wines, and they want to try to get as close to that every year, because it's what their customers have grown to expect from them. Blending helps winemakers to achieve these goals. They're trying to make something that's better than the sum of its part, whatever better means to that particular winemaker. Many wines are made from grapes from a few different vineyards, and winemakers need to figure out how to make the best wine from the variety of grapes that comes from different sites. Even if they're just round the corner from one another, Different vineyards can give different characteristics to the grapes because of soil, drainage, altitude, aspect, and even slight differences in the weather or shade from trees. Imagine you're a winemaker for a second with two different vineyards growing the same grapes. One of your sites might be ideal, in the middle of a steep slope with good water drainage and the soil less fertile to encourage really highly concentrated fruit. It might have a favourable aspect pointing towards the sun during the day and benefit from cool nights to ensure high acidity. However, because of the poor soil and cool temperature, yields would be low, meaning you can't make as much wine overall. Your other site might be in the warm and fertile valley floor. The fertile soils might grow a lot of big grapes that ripen with lots of sugar. But despite being able to grow lots of grapes down here, they will be lower in quality lacking decent flavour concentration, acidity and complexity maybe. In this instance, you have a choice. Make one really top-notch wine in small quantities from the premium site and another lower quality, less complex wine from the grapes from the valley floor. Or do you decide that rather than picking one or the other, you can use some of your premium grapes to upgrade the quality of the not so good ones and use the lower quality grapes to increase the volumes. This is where blending comes in, and this is actually one of the choices our first winemaker has made today. A single varietal wine made from grapes from two different sites with characteristics from both. So why don't we crack it open and see what we've got. Try not to finish all of the first two wines now, so we can go back and do a comparison shortly. Okay, so what do we think about this? We're definitely looking at an intense colour here. 
really deep dark purple, I reckon. The grapes we've got in our glasses is known as Shiraz in Australia, South Africa, and warmer climates, but its original name is Syrah, and that's what it's usually known as in France and other cooler climates. Whether it's Syrah or Shiraz can give us a bit of a clue as to the style of wine we're expecting. Today we're drinking a Shiraz from Australia, which means it's likely to be made in a warmer climate style. Regardless of whether we're talking about Syrah or Shiraz though, the wines tend to have this really deep thick color intensity, almost black in the middle, but with a rim of purple around the edge. And this is from the grape's thick skins. Let's take a quick sniff to see what we think about the intensity. I think we can absolutely mark this wine down as strong intensity. I'm picking up a decent concentration of a few different smells in there, and there's definitely a lot of fragrance to this wine. Now give it a good swirl to get some air in, followed by a proper smell to see what aromas we can pick out more specifically. It's a good point to pause if you like before we give the game away. I'm getting a few different aromas from this wine. The place to start for me is gonna be the black fruit section. The first thing I get is a big hit of ripe blueberry, almost like blueberry jam. I get some ripe black plum and some stewed black currants too. Maybe there's some black cherry in there as well, kind of black foresty gato kind of thing. Definitely a lot of ripe fruit here. Also a bit of a curveball. I get some slight kind of black olive or tapenade aromas coming through. And this is surprisingly common for Syrah and Shiraz wines. Moving on to the spice section, is there anything you can find there? Perhaps maybe a little bit of black pepper. In cooler climates, the peppery aroma is more concentrated and powerful. It's a relatively light smell here. Also get some licorice or star anise, which again, quite common for the grape variety. Moving along now to the next wheel, can you detect any aromas that might be coming from the winemaking process this wine has gone through? I can pick up some baking spice and perhaps a bit of smoke and coconut, as well as a faint vanilla, maybe a bit of clove as well. This wine has definitely seen some oak. In the same way that grapes from different vineyards can be treated separately before blending back together, producers can do this when they want to use winemaking techniques like oak aging too. In this case, the wine was matured in French oak barrels with 25% new oak being used. This doesn't mean that 25% of each barrel is made from new planks and the rest are old. It means that some of the wine is split out and put into new barrels and some into the old barrels for the aging part of winemaking. Once both batches have matured, the producer can blend them back together. They'll play around until they're happy with the proportions. In this case, they've gone for 25% of the new oak and 75% of the old to give us those more subtle aromas. Let's take a sip and swoosh it around our mouths to see what we can pick out there. Okay, so how do you feel about this? It's pretty intense stuff here, huh? Up front on the palate, I get that deep, dark fruit flavor, definitely that blueberry jam. Also a touch of the unusual black olive, licorice, pepper coming through. The oak aromas are definitely there too. The clove, some of that vanilla and smoke, definitely got some decent complexity going on in this wine. The smokiness almost starts to even hint forward towards like a smoky bacon flavor. Again, this kind of meaty bacon flavor pops up quite often with Syrah and Shiraz. Let's hop over to the next step in our process and see if we can pick apart the characteristics or structure a little bit. Starting with the body, I think we're looking at the full. Because of the warm climate in Australia, the fruit is ripe with a lot of sugar when it's picked, meaning that there is a lot of sugar to convert into alcohol. The high alcohol content, a whopping 14.5%, is giving the wine a really decent body and dense weighty feel. The tannins are high, but because of all that sunshine, they're actually really ripe and soft, so feel much smoother. And the oak helps to soften them too. It's not too overpowering or in your face, but because Syrah is a thick-skinned grape, there's definitely quite a bit here. 
All these, plus the full body, make it really pleasant to drink. It's got a great, almost velvety texture. Sweetness-wise, we are dry, despite all that sweet fruit. There isn't any actual sugar left in the wine. The acidity here is actually fairly high, at the high end of medium, which balances out that ripe fruit and helps add some structure and backbone to the wine. Syrah is a naturally acidic grape, but in this warmer climate, acidity starts to drop as the grapes ripen. Now we're on to conclusions, and I think we're definitely doing well intensity and complexity wise. With loads of different flavors and aromas, and all of them pretty powerful. Balance wise, we're good too. Those big tannins feel balanced with a good concentration of ripe fruit characteristics. With the finish, this one is quite an interesting one. For me, a lot of the flavor happens up front and then fades away relatively quickly. The flavor doesn't turn unpleasant, it just doesn't leave a long lingering taste in your mouth. And we'll come back to that in a second. This wine is called Hill and Valley. It's from Australia and a winemaker called Peter Lehman. And the name actually derives from the fact that the wine comes from two different vineyard sites. The first site in the cooler hills gives the wine a concentrated black fruit flavor, as well as the freshness and a bit more acidity. The second in the hotter, more fertile valley floor gives the wine some more confected, jammy, ripe fruit flavors and that high alcohol level that contributes to the body as well as providing a bigger volume of grape juice. The winemaker will have kept the grapes from each site separate throughout the winemaking process, then blending them together either after fermentation or barrel aging. This means that they're able to achieve a wine that elevates the less premium grapes from the valley and makes the higher quality grapes more affordable. With this one, you're looking at about 13 to 14 pounds a bottle. So for the money, I think you're getting a really incredible wine. From the same winemaker, a Shiraz that uses grapes from only the top sites costs around £30 a bottle. If you're into this, you're in luck because there are some amazing Syrah and Shiraz wines out there. If you like this bold, ripe style, you're after Shiraz. Check out this area of Barossa Valley in Australia or the nearby Clare Valley and Adelaide Hills. South Africa makes some great wines in the same style too. If you're after the coolest style Syrah, its natural home is in the Northern Rhone in France. Here they have some incredibly premium wines that you might have heard of from areas such as Cote Roti, Hermitage and Cornas. Those will be getting a little bit lighter in body than this, but with a touch more acidity, a bit more tannin and powerful concentrated aromas of black pepper, blackberry and graphite. Even when it's not from France, if you see Syrah on a label, it usually points more towards that kind of style, whereas Shiraz implies warmer, riper and richer. With this wine, I think something heavily spiced would work because of all the interesting spices and flavors it has. Middle Eastern dishes with heavily spiced lamb would work, perhaps some shawarma or a Turkish lamb kofta. Again, the complex spices and pepper in the wine will go really nicely. And because the wine is so flavorful, it can stand up to some strong meat flavors. Even some Indian dishes would work well, but don't try and pair it with anything too spicy as the high alcohol content and the spice combo might be a bit too fiery for some. It's now time to open our next wine, so if you've got anything left in your glass, pop this back into the bottle for now and pour out your next wine. Again, try and save a little sip at the end. We're now moving on to another grape that also has a couple of different names, depending on where you're from. In France and much of the wine growing world, it's known as Grenache. But in Spain, where we're headed to now, it's called Garnacha. This is 100% Garnacha, but it's a really common grape to find in blends across Spain and all over the world. If you take a look at the wine, you can hopefully notice a difference in color between this and the last. It's not as intense, the color's a little bit lighter, medium. And it's a little bit of a different shade too. While our last one was definitely purple, here I'd say we're somewhere between purple and ruby. Ah, let's give it a sniff. It's still fairly intense, but not quite as much as the last one. Medium's strong. There's definitely a bit going on here, so let's start picking it apart. 
first thing I'm getting here is red fruit. We're definitely looking at things like raspberry, strawberry, and cranberry this time. Maybe even some red cherries too. There's a difference between the kind of fruit we're getting as well. It's not so rich or most jammy fruit like we had with the last wine. It's a little bit more tart. The fruit has a bit of brightness and freshness to it. There's something slightly herbal here as well. Maybe it's dried thyme, perhaps some white pepper. We don't have much from the next couple of wheels. With Grenache, they don't tend to mess around with it too much in order to let the fruit do the talking. This wine isn't seeing anything in the age department yet either. It's still young. So let's have a taste and see what we reckon. Okay, so I'm really picking out those fruit flavors. I'm getting a lot of that raspberry and some of that cranberry too. It's a little bit of thyme or dried herbs. And let's hop over to structure and see what we can find out. Despite the lighter color, I'm definitely getting a decent body. And this is coming from the alcohol in the wine. Grenache as a grape can get pretty boozy. This wine is from Bodegas Aroa, a natural winemaking bodega in the Navarra region in northern Spain, in the shadow of the Pyrenees. Both the latitude and the altitude make the climate cooler. Despite these cooler temperatures, the grape is still making a really high alcohol wine because Grenache as a grape accumulates lots of sugars, which leads to more alcohol in our final wine. In hotter climates, even more so. That high alcohol is contributing to the full body of the wine. On tannins, we're in the area of medium here. Again, this is pretty typical for the grape. It's a really smooth wine and very nice to drink. Grenache isn't a particularly high tannin grape. So single varietal Grenaches can be a great option if you're looking for tons of flavor and full body, but not so much tannin. Sweetness, again, we're looking at a dry wine so we can move on to acidity. And this is medium, maybe even a medium plus. Next, let's have a look at our conclusions. With this one, it's still got a good intensity, but I can't pick out quite so many different flavors, so wouldn't score it quite so highly on complexity. Balance-wise, it's still really good. Despite the high alcohol, it doesn't give us a nasty burning sensation. It's pretty smooth and has that nice freshness to it. On to the finish, and this one for me is much longer than the last. I can taste the red fruit for quite a while after I finish my mouthful. I'd say this wine is good. It's not mind-blowing, but it has a really nice example of a pure Grenache wine. And it's got some good examples of the characteristics that we'd expect from this wine. Good fruit flavor, freshness, and balance, despite the high alcohol and full body and a nice long finish. Garnacha, or Grenache, is made in lots of different styles. Lots of newer, brighter styles are being made with less tannin extraction. And this leads to light and juicy styles of wine that can be served slightly chilled. So if it's a hot day, maybe go for a glass of Garnacha and a bowl of gazpacho. Or if you're looking for something to get you through the winter, beef and lamb stews would be fab too. Now we've covered Syrah and Grenache individually and find out which characteristics each grape has. As you might have guessed, with our next wine, we're about to find out what happens when you blend the two grapes together. This will give us a wine that takes certain characteristics from one variety of grape and some from another. To do this, we're headed down to the Rhone Valley. So pop the remainder of your Garnacha back into the bottle, and pour out your next wine, and let's find out a bit more about the style of wine they make here. Right now we're in the Rhone Valley, which is split into two parts. In the slightly cooler Northern Rhone, Syrah is the only red or black grape permitted in the red wine there. The more moderate climate wines won't be in quite the same style as ones from sunny Australia. They'll be a touch more acidic and more peppery. The best ones do have super concentrated fruit flavors though, and make some spectacular wines. To help with this, vines are grown on these super steep slopes that face directly into the sun. One of the regions in Northern Rhone is actually called the Cote Roti, or Roasted Slope. The different appellations are all pretty small, and as such, most of the wines from the Northern Rhone are pretty expensive. 
In what's known as the Southern Rhone, the rules are a little bit more flexible on what grapes you can use. They still grow Syrah here, but they're also allowed to use a whole range of other grapes and carefully blend them together to create complex blended wines. A winemaker can dial certain elements up or down depending on what they're looking for to create the style they want. That's helpful for these guys where the climate can be a bit more unpredictable than sunny Australia. Blending's the norm for the region's entry-level wines, Côte de Rhone's, the slightly more premium Côte de Rhone Village, and it's even the case for the super premium appellations such as Chateau Neuf de Pat. Not all of the wines have to be blended, but most of them are. In fact, blends are so much a part of this area that there are 21 different grape varieties permitted in the Côte de Rhone and Côte de Rhone Village appellation rules. And even in Chateau Neuf de Pat, they're allowed to use up to 13 different grapes. This can mean that there's actually quite a lot of variance in some Chateau Neuf de Pat wines. People often use it as a reference point for quality when they talk about fancy wines, citing it as premium and prestigious. While you can get some amazing Chateau Neuf de Pape, there's actually quite a lot of bad ones that are purely trading on the name. In fact, if you've got £20 to spend, your money might go a little bit further if you head to the Southern Rhone's other appellations, such as Vacaras, or where we're headed now, Gigondas. Both of these appellations, along with Chateau Neuf de Pape, tend to feature three grapes most heavily. Syrah, Grenache, and Mouvedra. Despite all the different grapes that are allowed, we're actually looking at 80% Grenache and 20% Syrah with this, which should hopefully be fun to pick apart having just tried both of these different grapes on their own. Looking at the wine, it's a bit of a mix. It's lighter than the Shiraz we drank for sure, and definitely not quite as purple. I'd say there's a bit more of a ruby color coming from the Grenache here. There's a good intensity and some big flavors are jumping out of the glass for me. I can pick out some of our black fruit flavor, maybe some blueberry, not quite as jammy as with the warmer climate Australian wine, but definitely still there. A bit of black pepper and herbs, that's coming from the Syrah. And I think I get a little bit of red fruit coming through too. Some strawberry, maybe raspberry, maybe a bit of red cherry and a nice bit of brightness from the Grenache. There's a touch of oak here, but nothing overpowering. This wine was made in large oak foudres, big old barrels which don't give quite as obvious vanilla and spice flavors. Although this wine is only three years old, it gets some truffle or mushroom coming from the third wheel and maybe a bit of tobacco and smoky bacon too. Let's take a sip now to find out what flavors we can taste as well as getting a look at the structure of this wine. Up front, flavor-wise, I'm getting a big hit of that darker fruit. The plum, the dark cherry, and the blueberry. That's coming from the Syrah component of the blend. And as that fades away, I start to notice the red fruit. Some strawberry, some red cherry, all the stuff that the Grenache is bringing to the table. There's a touch of smokiness to the wine and some clove. That's not coming from the grapes, but from those big oak barrels. With the body, I think we can definitely go for full. Both the Syrah and the Grenache are adding to this. The thick skin Syrah gives lots of color and texture, along with Grenache's high alcohol, which adds to the body too. Up next on tannin, I think we're on high. The skins from the Syrah are giving it some grip. And because this is a cooler region than before, it means the tannins are slightly more pronounced and grainier. The Grenache in the blend is balancing that back out though, so, the finished wine is not too overpowering tannin-wise. On acidity, I'd say we're somewhere around the high end of medium here. Kind of the same of both of them separately. Conclusion-wise, there's a good intensity and complexity to this wine, and the balance is great. We've got the best of both grapes helping with that. In terms of the finish, it's really good too. If you try and imagine the wine in three stages, the upfront, the middle, and the finish, I think we get that deep black fruit up front, and in the middle from the Syrah, but then the Grenache kicks in and you get that fresh red fruit and the long finish from this grape. This is one of the examples of why the two grapes work well together. They both bring something unique to the table and together add different flavors and qualities, adding to the overall complexity of the wine. If you've got any wine left in the first two bottles, you could even go as far as making your own blend. 80, 20 Grenache to Syrah if you want to be precise. 
It's just a bit of fun, but you should be able to see how some of the different characteristics balance out. The black fruit up front, the red fruit in the middle, and the bigger tannins from the Syrah being softened by the Grenache. If you like these styles of wines, check out Vacaras too, or Chateau Neuve de Pape if you're feeling fancy. If you're after something a little bit more reasonable, Côte de Rhone and Côte de Rhone Village wines are often made from a blend of similar grapes, and usually priced more reasonably. They'll most likely be made a bit quicker and without the oak, creating easy, fruity styles. With all of these wines, you can usually find out what the blend is by looking online. Food pairing wise, this would go with a similar style of food as the last two. If you want to get regional, you can try the traditional French sausage and lentils dish. The famous Puy lentils come from the next valley over to the Rhone. Or if you're feeling extra fancy, something with black truffles to go with that special aroma the wine has. This vineyard actually sits at the bottom of the hills where most of France's black truffles are found. We're now going to move on to our next wine, which is also a blend, but as well as blending grape types, they're also mixing a couple of different production techniques to achieve a unique outcome. We're shooting down to Italy, the area of Veneto in the northwest. The Veneto region is most famous for producing both Pinot Grigio and Prosecco, but today we're looking more specifically at one of their red wines, Valpolicella which comes from the area next to Lake Garda, north of the city of Verona. Valpolicella is an area, but the wines known as Valpolicella are usually made from a blend of grapes, including Corvina, Corvione, Molinara, and Rondinella. You've actually got to be a little bit careful with Valpolicella because they can make quite a range of styles, and depending on the style, you might get caught off guard with something you're not expecting. At one end of the scale, you've got your standard Valpolicella and Valpolicella Superiore. These are pretty light and acidic red wines with red cherry aromas and low tannins. They're not too dissimilar in style to a Beaujolais. Everyday, easy drinking red wines. The Valpolicella Superiore are made from higher quality grapes with slightly stronger alcohol levels and a touch more required aging. Then at the other end of the scale, we have a wine called Valpolicella Reciotto which is a different ball game entirely. It's made from dried grapes and produces heavily perfumed, sweet red dessert wines. The grapes are left to ripen on vines and then picked and dried inside on racks. This evaporates all of the water, concentrating the sugars in the flavors. This technique is also used to produce Valpolicella Amarone. It's made with the dry grapes, but actually comes in a dry or off-dry style rather than sweet. Both of these wines have big, heavy bodies, high alcohol, a lot of spice, cinnamon, chocolate, dried cherry, raisin, and nutty aromas. But definitely an acquired taste. And if you don't know what to expect, it could come as a bit of a shock. So look out for Amarone and Reciotto on the label. The grape variety Corvina is used because it has thick skins that make it suitable for drying, and it adds red fruit flavors and high acidity to the final blend. Rondinella is a bit more simple, but it accumulates sugar really well, which helps for those sweeter and boozier styles and to keep it full bodied. So we've got our light, easy drinking wines, our regular Valpolicella and the Superiore. Then those unusual full bodied off dry to sweet styles. And then we have something in between, which is, you guessed it, a mix of both styles. The in-between wine is called a Valpolicella Repasso. Let's pop it in our glasses to check it out. Okay. Color-wise, we've got a medium ruby. Your regular Valpolicella would be in the same ballpark color-wise. This here is one of the Rapasso wines. It's from a producer called Corte Giara. Let's give it a sniff. Intensity wise, I get a big hit of slightly unusual aromas here. I get a lot of really sweet cherry aromas, like cherry drop sweets almost, cherry cola, or those glacé cherries you get in cocktails. There's some strawberry, a bit of blackcurrant too. Maybe even something kind of black currant leaf. There's definitely baking spice, maybe cinnamon and a touch of chocolate too, perhaps even some orange peel. It's all a bit mulled wine. Lastly, 
a kind of mixed herb or bitter herb, reminiscent of the strange herbal liqueurs you find at the back of a liquor cabinet. A bit of an unusually pungent bunch of aromas to find together. Let's take a sip and see what we've got going on in the flavor department. So it's rich, complex, and has a lot of those same flavors. It's a touch on the unusual side if we've not drunk one before, but I think that the sweet cherry herbal flavor is really nice. Body-wise, I'm gonna go with somewhere between medium to full. It's got a bit of warmth pointing towards the high alcohol content. But one of the other things that contributes to the body of a wine is the funky production technique. When they're making the Amarone and Reciotto wines with the dried grapes, they leave the skins in those wines fermenting. But once they've given those wines enough flavor, they'll skim them off and mix them in with a batch of the lighter, regular Valpolicella while it's fermenting. And that's what gives us this unique style of wine, the Rapasso. The extra grape skins still have a little bit of leftover sugar in them, and this new environment kicks the yeast back into action to carry on their job. This raises the alcohol levels and extracts more flavor, which explains why we've got so much fruit in the mix, as well as giving us some interesting flavors. It's also giving this wine a decent level of tannin, probably medium to high, because there's so much skin contact going on during the fermentation. The wine is definitely dry, but yeast has gobbled up all of the excess sugar on those extra grape skins. Acidity wise, it still has the high acidity from the blend of grapes used. If you're looking for something to eat with this, the perfect match would be a dish called Risotto al Amarone from the region's capital, Verona. This is a very simple risotto dish with a beautiful red color made from rice, stock, Valpolicella Amarone wine, one of the sweeter styles, and melted Monteveronese cheese. You could also try Figato alla Veneziana, a stewed liver and onion dish from nearby Venice. But any rich meaty stew would work too, with the full flavors and the acidity from the wine would cut through any richness really nicely. So what do you think of Valpolicella? Was it something you're keen to try more of or slightly too unusual? If you've not tried it before, it's definitely a unique wine and the flavor combinations might not be for everyone, but they're fun to know about. If you're in the market for something less wild, then let's get back on the road and head over to Spain for our next wine to find out about one of their famous blends. You've probably heard of Rioja before. Most people have probably drunk one. It's a mega popular wine style in the UK. Rioja is a wine region in the north of Spain, really close to Navarra, where the Garnacha we drunk earlier had come from. The wine started to gain a reputation in medieval times because a popular pilgrimage route to the Cathedral de Santiago de Compostela took pilgrims right through the heart of Rioja. Not much wine left the region though, as when you're traveling on foot, you don't want to be carrying a ton of wine for your pals back home. So its reputation didn't skyrocket in the UK until later than other popular regions like Bordeaux and Champagne. But if Rioja is the region, not the grape, what kind of grapes do they use in the blend? Well, there are actually red Rioja and white Riojas, and a few different grapes that are allowed in the mix. With red Riojas, we're looking at Tempranillo, Garnacha, Mazuelo, and Graziano. We've already tried a Garnacha, and maybe you've heard of Tempranillo too. This is the main grape used, and Graziano and Mazuela usually take a little bit of a back seat. In the next wine, we're looking at 90% Tempranillo with 5% each of Graziano and Mazuelo. Let's pop our next one into the glass then, and we can see what the Rioja blend tastes like in comparison to today's other wines. So color-wise, I think we're much deeper than the last. Perhaps ruby with a little bit of purple. And intensity-wise, I think it's definitely deep. Let's have a sniff. Okay, so another intense wine for you, but I'm already picking out some big differences to the last. Let's start on the first wheel. What do you get here? I've got black fruit for sure, a bit of cherry and some blackberry, perhaps a little bit of red fruit. But the fresh fruit flavors are a little bit muted for me, and so I'm going to hop over to the next wheel as I'm getting some definite aromas from here. Hopefully there's a few big aromas you can pick out here. Coconut for sure, 
maybe a little bit of smoke and vanilla and sweet baking spices. This wine has definitely seen a lot of oak and it's actually interestingly American oak that they use here in Spain. The practice of oak aging Rioja started in the 1700s when a Spanish duke visited Bordeaux and found out they were using new oak barrels. Because French oak was so expensive, they started importing oak from the Spanish colonies in America instead, and its use became a trademark of the Rioja style of wine. But American oak gives much stronger aromas and flavors than French, which is why these aromas are so strong. In fact, the use of oak is actually legally defined and listed on Spanish wine labels. Depending on how long the wine spends in contact with the oak, you get a few different terms. Firstly, there's Rioja Generico or Joven. If you see this on the label, chances are it's not even seen the inside of an oak barrel at all. It will be a fresh and fruity wine. Then you have Crianza. These wines have to spend six months in oak barrels, so we'll pick up a little bit of that oaky toastiness. After that, Reserva. This wine is a Reserva, and that means it spent 12 months in oak. That's where these intense coconut, vanilla, and spice aromas are coming from. Lastly, you've got Gran Reserva, which spends a whopping 18 months in oak. From these wines, you can expect even stronger oak characteristics. As well as the oak aging requirements, each category also has a minimum total aging requirement which can either be in the barrel again or in the bottle before it's sold. Generico or Hoven wines don't need to be aged at all, and the Grand Reservas need to be aged for at least five years before they're allowed to be sold. This wine, the Reserva, has to have a minimum of three years worth of aging, but this one actually has about five years of age on it. So we should start to pick up some of the aging characteristics. I know we don't get much fresh fruit, but I am getting some dried fruit from this wine. Perhaps some prunes and figs. We often see primary fruit drop off and turn into the dried fruit equivalents in older wines. I'm getting a little bit of leather, maybe a truffle or mushroom. All classic aromas from aged red wines. Let's try it and see if that helps to bring any more flavors and aromas out. So it's pretty powerful again intensity wise and breaking down flavors is a bit of dark ripe fruit up front followed with that coconutty oaky flavor. The body for this wine is definitely full. Rioja has very warm sunny summers so the grapes can develop lots of sugar meaning there's lots to convert into alcohol. Again, adding to the body. Tannins I'd say are medium to full. The main grape Tempranillo is relatively full bodied already and has thick skins, which gives us lots of tannin and flavor to extract. And a small amount of mazuelo in the mix is adding an extra hit of tannin. Oak aging also impacts the tannins. This wine has spent just over a year and a half in oak barrels, and the oak is imparting some more tannins to the wine, but also softening the ones that are there already. You should be able to feel them if you run your tongue around your teeth, but they don't have a sharp or bitter taste to them. Finally, on acidity, we're looking at medium to high. Not as much as the Valpolicella we just drunk, but Tempranillo is definitely an acidic grape. So conclusions for this wine. What do you reckon? I think we'd have to score it pretty high against all four. There's a decent intensity, a lot of complexity coming from the oak in the age. It's a well-balanced wine, nothing seems out of place, and it's got a really nice long finish. This is a very good wine, and it's a total bargain considering how good it is. It's from a producer called Ramon Bilbao, who are quite a large scale producer in Rioja. Like most Rioja producers, they make a range of wines such as the younger and simple Crianthas, and also even older, more oaky and premium Grand Reservas. If you like big, bold flavors, some interesting aromas and flavors from age, for Reservas and Grand Reserva Riojas are going to be what you want to look for. And compared to some other regions, they can be really good value for money. This wine is about £20 a bottle in a shop, meaning you can get it for about £30 to £40 in a restaurant. And Riojas are a great choice with food. If you compare that to something like a Bordeaux, you'll be getting a lot more for your money with Rioja. So if you're looking for something to pair with a rich and hearty meat dish, look no further. The intensity and complexity will help it stand up to strong flavors. 
and the acidity will help to cut through the richness. With food, the tannins will be less noticeable too. So if you're finding it slightly too much now, with a meal it'll probably be okay. I'm going to suggest pairing it with Spanish meatballs in garlicky and tomato sauce, or slow braised beef would also be amazing with this. All the rich meat will go down a treat with this intense wine. And with that, we're going to do some more jetting around the Iberian Peninsula as we move on to our final wine for today. And we're headed to another region where they're big on red blends and a region that's increasing in popularity at the moment. We're just going over the border from Spain to Portugal. Portuguese wine is starting to become more and more of a big deal. Until relatively recently, they were known mainly for their port. Port is an intense, sweet, high tannin, fortified style of wine made in the Douro Valley in the north of the country. Portugal has an absolutely enormous range of different grapes, some of which you never really find elsewhere, and some are grapes you find in other countries but under a different name. The fortified port wines can be made from over 30 different grapes, but there are five main varieties. Torriga Nacional, Torriga Franca, and Tinta Roritz, aka Tempranillo, the grape from Rioja, Cao, and Barocca. Over the past 10 years, wines other than port have started to come into fashion, in part because they're super affordable and there are also tons of grapes, blends, and individual areas to explore. There are lots of different winemaking areas in Portugal, all with different styles of wine. Vino Verde, which you may have heard of, is by the coast in the north. It's actually a continuation of the Spanish region, Rias Baixas, which is just the other side of the river to the north. Both Vino Verde and Rias Baixas are famous for Albarino or Alvarino, depending on where you're from. Both of these are light, fresh, zippy wines with good acidity and a slight spritz. But we're headed over next door to this, the Douro region. This is where the famous port wine comes from, made from grapes grown on the steep banks and terrace vineyards of the river Douro. As well as these heavily fortified dessert wines, they also make regular red wines out of a similar mix of grapes and a lot of producers will make both. We're going to look at one of these regular red wines now from the Douro, from Quinta do Infantado. Quinta means a state in Portuguese, so you'll see it popping up quite a lot on bottles, in the same way you see Chateau on a lot of French labels. Let's put the wine into our glasses and take a look. So I'd say we're yet again in the intense colour territory with a really deep colour. Again, somewhere between ruby and purple. How intense do you think this wine is? It's quite powerful, but I'm going to go with a medium for this one. We've definitely drunk some more intense smelling wines today. I get a lot of mainly black fruit coming out for wine. Some sweet red cherry, maybe some sharp red plum, some pomegranate. Something a little bit floral and a touch of smokiness too. The first grape in this blend is Tinta Roritz, aka Tempranillo. So you should pick up some similarities between this wine and the last. That's where that cherry is coming from. Hopefully you get some black or morello cherry. Next we've got Torriga Nacional, and that's giving us the sharp plum characteristics. Then finally we've got Torriga Franca. This grape is a little bit lighter than the other two and is giving us a bit of pomegranate, some strawberry and a slight floral characteristic. Let's take a sip and see if some of those flavours are still there when we taste. Okay, so there's big fruit flavour. It's really powerful. A bit more intense on the palate than it was on the nose. Hopefully you can taste those different layers of flavour from each grape. But jumping to structure, what do you think about the body? Again, I'm picking up a really full body and a lot of alcohol from this one. So a really hearty, full wine. Tannin wise, it's also really full on. This would definitely be high and definitely one to pair with food rather than drinking on its own. All three of the grapes being used are pretty high on tannin, and when you add them together, this is what you get. 
We mentioned that the grapes they used to make this wine are the same ones they used to make port. When they make a fortified port, the fermentation period is very short as they stop it by adding alcohol while there's still plenty of sugar to give the wine its unique sweet characteristics. Because of the short fermentation, they need to get as much color and tannin and flavor out of the grapes as quickly as possible. So when you use these grapes to make a regular wine, it gives a lot of tannin. We're definitely dry here though, not like the fortified wine, and acidity wise, we're looking at a medium to high. What are your thoughts on this wine? Are you a fan? Or is it starting to get a bit powerful and maybe a touch bitter for you? Some people love these big full bodied wines, others not so much. It's generally down to your sensitivity to bitterness, but it's really useful to know where the line is for you. So you can tell your servers what your limit is and they're likely to make better recommendations. It's definitely an intense wine flavor wise, but not so much complexity going on here as some of the other wines we've tried today. And despite the age, this is about five years old, we're not starting to pick up on a tertiary characteristics. Balance, we're pretty solid and the finish isn't bad, although could be a touch longer. This isn't a bad wine, especially for the money at about 15 pounds a bottle. I think my preference would be for something a little bit lighter and more acidic than this. The tannins are pretty strong, but as we mentioned, some food could help to soften those. And some people absolutely love these big bold wines and are probably having a great time right now. As far as food pairings would go, for me, it would have to be a Francis Senior. This is an outrageous Portuguese sandwich similar to a croque monsieur, but filled with beef and sausage and covered with cheese in a sauce made with port wine. Messy, but delicious. But again, the heavy tannin would go well with any red meat dish, or if you're a vegetarian, something that's relatively salty with big flavors. How about aubergine parmigiana? And that's us for today. We've run you through a few concepts today, so let's hop back to the beginning and go through for a quick reminder. First, we tried an Australian Shiraz, also known as Syrah. Here we talked about how even single varietal wines are often blended and how blending wine from different sites can help achieve the winemaker's desired outcome or greater consistency. Then we tried a Grenache to show off some of the different characteristics of this grape before moving on to the Rhone blend of both Syrah and Grenache to show what each of the grapes brings to the table to make the wines of the Rhone Valley so unique. With the Syrah bringing tannin, deep color, and upfront black fruit, and a Grenache giving the wine red fruit in the mid palette and a long finish. Next, we showed a common Italian blend in Valpolicella. That was a blend of a couple of different grapes, but also involved blending two totally different kinds of wines together by taking the skins off of one style of fermenting wine and adding them into another, giving us a unique perfume flavor and a lot of body and tannin. Then we moved over to Northern Spain, where we found out about the Rioja blend. We learned about the requirements for oak aging and general aging that can make those wines a value for money treat for anyone who's looking for complexity, big flavors, and some of the unique characteristics you get as wine ages. Lastly, we wound our way across to Portugal and found out how the same blend of grapes can be used for making fortified wines or some regular wines with massive body, flavor, and tannins, depending on the production methods. So now you know some more about blends, what do you think? We've covered a couple of the big ones today, and we also talk about some of the other blends throughout the course, such as the famous red and white Bordeaux blends. There's an almost endless amount of combinations of grape varieties for blends, but I'm afraid that's all we have time for today. We hope you had a good time and found some new wines that you've not tried before to add to the list next time you're out and about. If you check out the lesson page, you'll be able to find some more info about all of today's wines and links to buy. Please tag Wine Unpacked in any photos of your tasting session so we can see how you're getting on. We'll be back again next month with another handy lesson to help you get to grips with wine. Thanks gang, and see you next time.